Good afternoon, I'm Jim Ludwig, Major Gifts Officer here at Vegas PBS, and I wanna welcome you to our seminar today on wills and trust. We have two experts with us today. We have Rob Bolick and we have Shannon Evans. Before we get started though, I wanna thank our sponsor. We have a sponsor for these financial education seminars, and our sponsor is Silver State Schools Credit Union. So please enjoy this very brief message from Silver State Schools Credit Union before we get started. I'm Scott Arkells, President and CEO at Silver State Schools Credit Union. For the past 70 years, we have been committed to strengthening our community and providing excellent member service and financial solutions for every stage of life. At Silver State Schools Credit Union, our valued members are at the heart of everything that we do. Our purpose statement drives us, prioritizing people over profit. That is why we strive to be a good neighbor by investing time, money, and effort into partnerships that support our community. We are a proud supporter of Vegas PBS. Together, we are paving the path for financial success in our Southern Nevada community. Again, we cannot thank Silver State Schools Credit Union for being our sponsor of this. Now's where I need your help. In order for this seminar to be a success, we need your input so that we can ask our experts your questions. If you follow me and look over into the right-hand side of your screen, you're gonna see something which is called a chat box. Inside of the chat box is where you will type your questions. What I wanna do right now though, to make sure that you know where the chat box is, is ask you a question, and if you would please answer that question and then hit send. Today's test question is, what was your first car? And remember to hit send. An old Cutlass, a Mustang. Oh, I wonder what year. Give you a couple more seconds here. Let's see what else. I want to get at least three or four of these in. So my first car was a 1976 Chevy Impala, like the Blues Brothers drove in the movie with the cop car. <laughs> VW Rabbit, a Falcon. Never heard of that before. 1976 Plymouth. Okay, so you get the idea. This is where you're going to type your questions for our experts that are with you here today. Now, before we get started, though, I want to provide you with an update on what is going on at Vegas PBS. And we have Sal Carrera, the Director of Development at Vegas PBS, who's going to give you an update. So if I could have Rob and Shannon and myself um, remove our video so that we give the full screen to Sal, and then I'll call you back once he is finished. <clears throat> Here we go. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's virtual event panel discussion on wills and trusts. I'm Sal Carrera, Development <laughs> Director for Vegas PBS. Vegas PBS is so happy that you've joined us today. I want to thank all of you for being here and for diving into this important topic for planning for your future. But before I go any further, I want to thank today's presenters and members of our Vegas PBS Plan Giving Council, Shannon Evans and Rob Bolick. We're so grateful for the insights that you're gonna share with us on wills and trusts, and also for sticking around and, and answering some of our attendee questions. For years, Vegas PBS has been dedicated to enriching the lives of others by delivering quality, thought-provoking, and trusted content into the homes of our community. And today's event is just one more example of how we do that. Did you know that for 12 consecutive years, Vegas PBS has ranked in the top five most watched PBS stations in the country. Recently, we were nominated for six different Emmy Awards in projects like The Showgirl, a Las Vegas icon, the Vegas PBS Kids Writing Contest presented by Janice Allen, and Vegas PBS Steam Camp, where we are thrilled to share with you today that Vegas PBS has brought home three Pacific Southwest Emmys for the station 
in addition to several Tele Awards. I want to express my gratitude to all of you for being part of all that Vegas PBS has achieved. <clears throat> Beyond programming, we're a connector in the community, a safe place for the exchange of ideas, a vital educational resource, a platform for career training, a critical link in the emergency notification system, and so much more. It's through your support that all of this has been possible. And I personally thank all of you for being believing in us and the importance of the work that we do. Members like you are the force behind our team. And I believe that supporting uh, our work truly does improve lives. I want to thank our Plan Giving Council for the work that they do on these important financial education programs. And today, if you didn't know, is our 10th virtual seminar. We're so proud to bring these important financial education seminars to you. I'm looking forward to learning along with you about wills and trusts. I want to thank the 210 plus members of our Silver Legacy Society, those who have agreed to leave Vegas PBS as a beneficiary in their estate. These testimonial and transformational gifts are vital to the success of our mission. I want to thank Shannon Evans, Rob Bolick for being here again today. For this seminar to be successful, we need your participation. So remember to send your questions via the chat box, like Jim said, at the right of your screen. <clears throat> thank you again and enjoy today's program. Oops, we can't hear you. Can't hear you. There. I'll get the hang of this one day. I can't wait to be in person more than you people can imagine. We actually have our third guest joining us as well. We have David Strauss. Uh, David, we had a little tech, some technology challenges, uh, but he is with us. Um, and he's actually coming to us um, remotely from Arizona. So David will be joining us sh um, shortly as well. Uh, Sal did mention that um, we received three Emmys. I wanted to play a, a very 30-second uh, clip that we have, which shows you the three Emmys that we won. So please enjoy this uh, brief uh, spot. Vegas PBS is the proud winner of three Emmy Awards. Informational and instructional, Vegas PBS Steam Camp. Public Affairs, Vegas Strong, connecting during COVID-19. Arts and Entertainment, Vegas PBS Kids Writers Contest presented by Janice Allen. Our talented production team is grateful for viewer donations like yours, which allow us to create winning titles that reflect the values of our community. To see these productions and other locally produced content, visit VegasPBS.org. Thank you so much. Now, before we get started, um, we have four questions that we want to ask you which will help guide our experts into what's going on. The first question is, and it's a poll question, is did you attend our seminar on wills and trust in January? Please answer or no. We'll give you a couple seconds and then we'll see what our response is. Our response is, okay, so a third of you attended our seminar in January and two thirds of you are brand new. So that's great. That'll help us uh, with our presentation today so that we're not repeating what we already told you in January. Question number two, and this is probably the most important question we're gonna ask today. Do you currently have a will or a trust? Again, just click either yes or no. <clears throat> and let's see our response. Kind of the flip-flop. So I would say two thirds of us have a will or a trust and a third of us do not. Well, hopefully after today's seminar, that will change to 100% have a will or a trust, or at least during the process of doing that. 
Our third question, do you know where your beneficiary form is? And more importantly, have you reviewed it recently? Okay, so about half and half. And then probably the, la the last question we have is, have you recorded the homestead exemption on your home? We have three choices for you. Either yes, no, or I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, let's see our response. Okay, that's very interesting. Okay, so less than half have, and then another 33% have not, and 24% of you don't know. Well, I guarantee you after today's seminar, you will, that, those numbers will definitely change. So now let's get to the nuts and bolts of why we are here today. If I could have all of the presenters, which is Shannon, David, and Rob, um, if they would click on the third circle down on the right-hand side, I'll tell you what, we're going to get started here, and then we'll have David click in. So we're having, again, some technical challenges. Again, I cannot tell you how excited I am to get back into in-person events. Uh, I know Rob is and Shannon as well. For those of you who have seen her in our seminars, um, she literally walks around the studio while she's talking and everything else. So we're gonna get this um, thing started and I'm just gonna propose the easiest question I can to you, Rob, and see if you can uh, get us going. Okay. What is a will and a trust and why do we need one? Okay, very good. <clears throat> so that's usually the first question is, oh, I have a will, I have a trust, do, do I need a will, do I need a trust, What's, what are the issues? So basically, starting with a will, a will is a document where you have your wishes, your will known to the court, when I pass away, here's what I want to have happen with my assets. So. A will is good in that you can designate who you want as the personal representative who's going to administer your estate and also where it's going to go. You've all heard of will challenges and contests or somebody gets disinherited or whatever happens. So with a will, you can make sure that your wishes are followed whenever you pass away and you can name someone uh, it doesn't have to be a Nevada resident. It's wherever they happen to live. That's fine. So advantage of a will is whatever you say happens. Disadvantage, if there is associated with this, would be a will equals probate, namely you have to go to court. So if you have a will, uh, you pass away. Uh, basically, I try to explain to my clients, you consider that to be a formal invitation for them to go to court. So going to court is good for attorneys, not so good for beneficiaries because it costs a bunch of money, takes a bunch of time, and is kind of a pain in the rear. So, so that's what a will in, is involves. Uh, better to have one than not. Uh, which, by the way, that you probably didn't realize this, but that was a trick question that Jim had. Do you currently have a will or a trust? The answer is yes. So if you haven't written one yourself, don't worry, the Nevada legislature has already written one for you, the intestacy statutes that say exactly what happens when you die. So you don't have to worry about it, you're already covered. Um, the other option is a trust. So a trust is an instrument that you can create this document, a living trust while you're alive. You're the trustee, you're the beneficiary. You put your assets inside of the trust. Now, when you pass away, the trust doesn't. And so you don't have to go to probate anything that's in the trust. 
And so the trust axes will substitute. Uh, if I wanted to go to A, B, C, and D, and I want so-and-so to be the successor trustee, similar to the executor or personal representative of the uh, estate. And so essentially the trust has the advantage of it's private, it's not recorded or filed anywhere, nobody knows what you have done, and you can bypass the legal system by uh, doing it outside. So it's uh, trust is a better way to go. Um, some of the questions which maybe we can address later are what what do you need to have? When is it justified? When is a will okay? When is a trust? We can get into that in a little more detail, just the background. Kind of the bottom line, what I tell my clients is if you like your attorney more than your kids, get a will because that's good for attorneys. If you like your kids more than the attorney, then a trust is a better way because that way you can avoid the legal system. So that's a summary of wills versus trusts. Thank you. Shannon, would you like to add anything? You know, we've all seen in the news recently in the past couple of years, very, very successful people that die without planning. Tony Shea. He's young, but he passed away unexpectedly. Prince, the entertainment person, had none. Aretha Franklin, interestingly, apparently had some wills, but they were different versions stuffed in the side of her couch. All those are bad planning techniques and lead to expensive fighting between the heirs. So wills and trusts help you direct how things pass out, and they can limit um, anyone's exposure. For instance, if someone has someone in the family they definitely don't want to inherit, you can say in a trust or a will, I omit this person. And nobody cares why. You don't have to say because it's a bad person. You can just say, I'm intentionally not including this person in my estate. And then they can't really fight. It just stops fighting. Another thing people forget all the time, and Rob and I have worked together, and David too, so many years. We're older than we look. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, a lot of people have um, family members, children or brothers, sisters, niece, nephews, who have um, either special needs because they've been in accidents or have um, disabilities or also just have some addiction issues that don't let them um, want to inherit things outright when they're 18. If you don't have any planning at all, and if someone is, a, and once they turn 18, they can just have full reign and control of whatever it is. And that's fine for some people, but I don't know about you, my daughter's 19 and I wouldn't want her to have full control of all the money and she's really smart. So it lets you have, uh, over time, more to pass out things to people in a little bit more controlled environment. And also one thing that people forget, Rob, we'll talk about this, is people think trust gives you asset protection. A normal trust doesn't give you any protection. It avoids probate. It avoids guardianship if you're hurt. You could say who would take over and help you until you get better. It controls how things pass out over time to your kids or the little <clears throat> brats, the little rats. And you can have control that way. It can be a name that's not your name, like the Desert Rose Trust. But ultimately, you're the owner, and it's your social security number, or you and your spouse, and um, it's not really an, an asset protection technique. One thing maybe Rob could talk about now is when people um, pass away or get divorced, you have to change it. Want to hit that, Rob? No, that's, yeah, all of those are good. One is just some of the other things that I, we're going to talk about more. Uh, for the package, it's it's good to have the trust because, yes, it can avoid a will contest. It can avoid a dispute. Um, one of the nice things that I like to do within, within a trust is you can set up things for the kids, for the beneficiaries to protect them. Yep. And so typically in a will, you'll say, yes, when I pass away, it goes, I have, you know, three kids, it goes equally to the kids like that. The problem, one of the problems can be, what if one of the kids is in the middle of a divorce, not a good time to inherit, or they just were in a car wreck or filed bankruptcy or a myriad of other things that can happen. Uh, what I like to do in our trust is built in uh, some safeguards there that if the beneficiary isn't in a position where it's gonna help the beneficiary, that you just turn off the faucet and nothing comes out until the bad thing goes away. So that way you just want to make sure that it goes to, you know, use child as an example. You want it to go to the child, not the creditors of the child. Or if the child is not responsible, you want it, you don't want money to go to your child in a way that they might hurt themselves with it, if they're going to be substance abuse or whatever. So you can have all of these safeguards built into a trust that typically you don't have in a will. Lastly, <clears throat> what I like to do is Let's say, use the example, if you got three kids, instead of 
writing three checks to the kids goes into the checking account, that tends to be spent. You know, the average, national average is whatever you inherit is gone 18 months later, okay? So some people are very adept and they can have it be gone in three or four months. You know, other people, you know, can, can have it last longer. But what I like to do is set up separate trusts, three separate trusts for the kids, have the assets go there into the trust for the kids. Once the kids, you mentioned minors, you don't want it to go particularly in a divorce situation. You don't want it to go to the ex-spouse as the custodian. That, that would be, you know, guardian. That would not be good. Um, so you have it go into the trust. You can choose who you want as the trustee. When your child is old enough and responsible, he or she can become his own trustee, her own trustee. And what I like to do is I like to have those trusts last throughout the life of your child. It can be a built-in prenuptial agreement, okay? It is your child's separate property. It's not child plus spouse. It's not child plus anybody else. So it's for your child. Your child gets married, it's still your child's. Your child gets unmarried, it's still your child's. And it doesn't go anywhere else. It's free from claims of creditors and everything else. So your, your child has a 16-year-old who cream somebody, car wreck, you know, nobody can get whatever's in that trust. It's held for his or her benefit. So the, yeah, lots of lots of good things you can do in a trust that typically you don't have in a will. So Jim, Shannon. <laughs> Got it. Yep. Um, Shannon, you're you're the queen of examples. Can you give us some uh some uh, positive examples and then on the flip side some uh, uh challenging examples that you've had with clients over the years yeah sure well i think i learn more when people make mistakes don't you david and rob i learn from mistakes that other people make the most i recently had a situation where the father passed away and the mother passed away about eight months later which we all know happens more than you would think quick in a time and their kids were adults and they weren't special needs they were perfectly rational so they they basically had the trust say outright to all of them it was quite a bit of money well unbeknownst to them one of their daughters and her husband had just filed bankruptcy. So they didn't know that. So she's gonna get an outright distribution in the middle of a bankruptcy, which risks all the inheritance. And so it's much better if you have checks and balances like Rob was talking about with the trustee that they don't have to pass out everything right away, just in case they're in the middle of something like that, you don't want to expose it. Sometimes mm -hmm. really good things happen and we all can tell stories. But one situation I had that was really especially important to me was a lady was older i think she was in her 80s and she had an adult daughter who was a uh, down syndrome very wonderful person she lived in a home with other kids and adults and she had a job and she worked and she was happy and fine but she couldn't really take care of all the finances herself she and she was on some kind of ssi and so the lady had appointed a trustee to take care of her that she trusted for her life as a personal trustee to make sure what she needed did she want clothes did she want to go on vacation and she also had a financial trustee to handle the money that may not be the same skill set for everyone and i'm sure um, rob and david can talk about that too but that worked out really well and when the mom passed away the daughter was well taken care of and everything was okay Thank you. We actually have a question come in. It's a long one, so bear with me, okay? If I have a will, comma, power of attorney, healthcare proxy trust and financial POA, hopefully you understand what the, all, you understand all those terms. I have some of my investment accounts that have transfer on death. Do these investment accounts need to be put inside my trust? Well, Does it depends. That make are they transferring on death to the trust or are they transferring on death to the people, to, to the heirs? Sounds like it's transferred on death to the person, I would assume. But again, I'm just reading. Yeah, I could. Yeah. Go ahead, Rob. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, it's a good idea to have those uh, to have those inside of the trust, not to have a POD. Basically, the POD has it's it's a dumb designation namely it does it doesn't take care of any of the contingencies such as if the beneficiary predeceases you you now have a probate because it goes to the beneficiary's estate and then who knows where it goes from there the other one is <clears throat> again some of the things we talked about uh, you don't want the money going to somebody if it's not a good time to receive it. Like in Shannon's example, like I, a lot of different things, it may, makes a whole lot of sense to put it in the trust instead because the trust will have 
all of the different contingencies of protecting the beneficiary from themselves and the rest of the world, which just a straight out beneficiary designation POB won't have. So I always recommend, yes, put it into the trust. It's also, safer. Here's, here's a big point that we all know very well. The trust isn't just for when you're dead, it's for you. And if you get hurt or incapacitated and it's in the trust, whoever you name to be the trustee, if you're hurt, takes over and they can pay things for your benefit and help you. So it's not just for when you're dead, it's also for, if, for when you're alive. So people forget that it's not just TOD means transfer on death. POD means pay on death, and they're both ways to avoid probate by having something go directly to the people you name. But like Rob was saying, there's not really depth to it, and also it doesn't help you if you're just incapacitated, which people forget that's part of the reason you have a trust. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, I'm going to, uh, uh, you don't need to see my face because you need to see the experts here, so I'll just be like the voice coming down to ask some questions here. Um, Retirement accounts like 401ks are our IRAs, they have different rules than non-retirement accounts. And when someone inherits one, there's a whole different system in place for how they're taxed and how they pass on. So the general rule is you don't name a trust as a beneficiary of an IRA because it already avoids probate. If it's going to go to a non-spouse, it's called an inherited IRA. And there's brand new rules that just started in January where they have to take it out over 10 years from when the person dies. Not every year over 10 years, just any time by the 10th year, it has to be empty. And as you take it out, it's taxable. Versus inherited assets, mostly are not taxable and you inherited it unless it's over the estate credit. So <clears> mostly <throat> IRAs are the only taxable thing that comes out. So people with IRAs, that's why we asked, do you know where your beneficiary is? Because that form is everything, not your will, not your trust. It's that form. If you have a beneficiary form that you filled out when you set up your 401k or IRA, find it and make sure your first choice and your second choice is correct and up to date and put that with your other documents so they can find it. Okay. Additions, guys? And, oh. and Shanna, one other thing, it doesn't have to be a person that's a beneficiary. You can give it to a organization. Is that correct? Yes. And so and maybe what, one that rhymes with Vegas PBS <laughs> <laughs> or something, anything, you know, anything to do. Hi, everybody. Um, Oh, David, hey. I apologize. Little technical difficulties. We've had some pretty crazy fires out here, but let's, uh, sorry to interrupt. Woo. So um, I wanted to just comment on the powers of attorney on the prior question. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, the participant indicated, yes, I have a trust. I have my pour over well. Generally have two powers of attorney, a financial power of attorney, one for health care. So in the package, that's typically what you're gonna do uh, is to have the powers of attorney in place as well. So I have an example, well, let me back up. So, <clears throat> so with the, in your power of attorney, you designate who you want to make financial decisions for you if you're incapacitated. So you're alive, but something happens, you're unavailable, you can't do this, you have your trusted person then can make those decisions for you. Uh, also a very, high importance is also the medical power of attorney. Under the Nevada form now, you can it, it encompasses both um, what you want to do while you're alive and also has the end of life, the uh, DNR sort of things, the living will part of under what circumstances do I want food and water, yes or no? Would I like uh, medication to reduce pain? There, there's all sorts of different things that are there. We have, in fact, one of our uh, planned giving council members is in the hospital with her dad right now. And, uh, and she has that power of attorney for him. And now she's able to be there and to make those decisions for the doctors uh, to be able to give the input on what's gonna happen with dad. And so those are, those are important to have. We also had, Another person um, have a have a financial power of attorney and able to make some last minute transfers into the trust to avoid probate where the parent hadn't done that. And so able to avoid probate, able to talk to the physicians and get everything done. So those those are two important things to have is the powers of attorney. And uh, I think well, oh, I'm sorry. Or I'm gonna say just lastly, lastly, uh, Nevada has what they call the lockbox which right. lets 
you, which lets you upload. You can transfer a copy of your medical power of attorney to the secure Secretary of State site. You get a little card so you can, an emergency happens, you're at the hospital, you're wherever, any physician, any hospital, somebody can access that that's online and be able to then know what, what your wishes were as far as your health care or end of life thing. So David, take over. Yep. No, I was just gonna bring up for the viewers, I think it's really important because we did pass some new statutes in 2019 regarding powers of attorney for health and property. And if you wanna stay in your own home and not have to have a guardianship in order for you to leave your home, uh, every viewer needs to update and look at those. And especially since 2009, when we updated the statutory forms, a lot of people haven't looked at this for 11, 12 years. It's really important that you get with your estate lawyers or an estate attorney and address some of these new changes in Nevada law so you avoid a guardianship and conservatorship. It's really critical. Just wanted to bring that up. Hey, Robin, David, let's talk about this. Power of attorneys typically mean you're hurt. And here's something really, really important, and we'll all talk about this in good stories. Let's say you're uh, an adult like us and you have a relationship, maybe a long-term relationship. You're not married, but it's a committed relationship. Well, if you're not on each other's power of attorney for medical decisions, you have no authority to speak for someone else if you're not legally married. They won't even talk to your friend of 15 years. Talk about that, guys, because that happens every day. Yeah, I think our statutory form also has a HIPAA authorization built into it. And to get copies of medical records and discuss things with at least getting medical records is one thing. But as 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 uh, Shannon brought up, it's critical to name those people that you want to serve or else they won't be able to serve. And Rob, you probably have some experience on. That. Oh, yeah. So one of the one other comment is like, David, you mentioned, if you haven't done it in the last two years, it's a good time to do it to make sure you're current under the under current law. Um, there's kind of a kind of a difference here between trusts and, and wills and then for powers of attorney in that the trust kind of it's the longer it's been in place the cooler it is nice we have history we, we know that this is what you wanted for a long time kind of the opposite is the case for powers of attorney that people like the more current ones because it shows your more current wishes um, California I don't know if they still do but they have these things self-destruct after seven years so if you didn't update it every seven years it automatically was uh, not not effective so Nevada doesn't have that but but again the concept of having something current and up-to-date is makes a lot of sense I, I have one question if I can add it um, let's say you had everything set up in another state hypothetically me um, in Ohio and I have a will, I have a trust, and I have my power of attorney all set up. I move to Nevada. Is it valid? Well, yeah, trust, trust move with you state to state under the full faith, the credit of the Constitution, the Commerce Clause. So they're good in all states. All they are is contracts. You should look at your durable powers of attorney for health and property for the state you live in. But generally, like with wills, if they were valid in the state that you executed them, Nevada generally will honor those. And based on the requirements in most states, I've not seen that to be a problem. Uh, Rob, have you ever seen that? No, what, uh, no that, that's a good point. So will and trust is fine. Powers of attorney, they're, they're state specific and they have their own statutes. Uh, if you, by the way, Jim, good move, Ohio to Nevada. I commend you on that. That was an, I don't want to offend anybody. So anyway, good, welcome, welcome to Nevada. Okay, so let, let me, so on the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, on the powers of attorney, what you don't, a lot of times if there is a, uh, an accident or something, there's an emergency, you're there at the hospital, you don't want whoever the hospital is to say, oh, this isn't our form. Let me call our legal department and see if we can authorize right. this and we'll get back to you in 48 hours and they're bleeding to death. Obviously, you know, that's a silly example, but you know, it's it's good if you if you have a if you're in Nevada to have a Nevada form so people can look at it, accept it immediately without having any questions. But yes, hopefully they will honor one done somewhere else. So yeah, for, awesome. for my clients that have for my clients that have moved in from another state, it's yeah, your will is good, your trust is good. However, you probably don't have a lot of cool things inside of your trust that so you probably could. So let's talk about that. But what you really want to do is get the Nevada forms for your powers of attorney. Also, guys, we all have a lot of clients that moved here from California. 
made to escape the tax, franchise tax board. So most California trusts are fine, but there's a clause in there saying California law applies. So one thing when you come here, you should at least change that clause and amend the trust so it's not California law that applies because you don't want to inadvertently open the door to continuing California taxes. And right? Shannon brings up a good point. In California, when you pass, the administration is much more complicated than it is in Nevada. You have to give certain copies of documents to certain ch spouses, children, brothers, sisters. So if you want more privacy, uh, you want to look at that when you come here too. Good point, Shannon, though, the California. Yeah, I, think, uh, I think the technical term is it's Californication. <laughs> <laughs> you are the right house. You want to be Nevada. You don't want Cal, yeah, okay. <laughs> and Nevada also, you, like Rob was mentioning earlier, I couldn't uh, chime in, but you know we have great statutes here for beneficiaries where you can be the trustee of your own trust for even health education, maintenance and support. And it's free of divorce, bankruptcy, lawsuits and creditors where spouses get zero, grandchildren get all. And these trusts in Nevada since 2005 can go for 365 years as long as they're below a certain exemption and generation skipping was allocated, generation skipping exemption was allocated. Just know that Nevada is a very good state to do planning in and we're in this state and just keep. I think here's a little topic we've had happen many times. Usually the successor trustee, if you can't be it, and the financial power of attorney and the executor are the same kind of thing because it's who handles money if you're dead or hurt. So we've all had this happen. I'm sure we'll tell some stories. Your first choice is probably your spouse or your most trusted person, but everybody picks a second choice in case that person's not available. Well, if you pick the wrong second choice and they have control of your money, it can be a disaster. You don't just throw in the second choice name like, oh, if my wife can't do it, it's going to be my brother. And as Shannon brought up, and Rob did too, that's why it's important for everybody to review their documents currently. It's like tuning up your car. The car we build as advisors, Rob, Shannon, and myself, need to be tuned up every few years. Not a complete rewrite, but at least look and make sure because you spend more time on tuning up your car than you do the trust that holds everything you've ever worked so hard for. So it's worthwhile to get out there and meet with people, your state attorney, and, and get some current, make sure it complies with your current wishes and everything. Unless you have a Tesla. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, that's an exception. I have another question from the audience. Um, and bear with me while I read this. Can the trust include instructions on how to liquidate investments after death of the last surviving trustee? And do these liquidations need to happen all at once? Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. Because it was legalese for me, so please help. I just got done doing this for a developer in Las Vegas where he trimmed down the these trust administrative powers in the document, and we had to specifically not incorporate Nevada's by reference because they're automatically incorporated, and he has certain, uh, certain requirements and things he wants to have happen. So I know you guys have seen this over the years where you'll get a client <clears throat> who want certain things liquidated. I'm a believer in a lot of discretion because it's nice to wait and see what happens like the housing market taking off and then you're forced to sell something right away within a period of time or a company business or something. But I've seen it and done it. And I think if that's what you were talking about, I've drafted that whole, I do that. Yeah, my my thought, clients, uh, they, like, they like specificity. They like to say, I want this to happen or this to not happen. Whenever they say that, I always try to talk them out of it. It's like, whatever you say is not is either going to be too much or too little. It's not going to be ever exactly right. You know, like David, like you said, this isn't a good time to choose to sell real estate or et cetera, et cetera. So, so if you just, what I tell people is you had better trust whoever you have as your trustee. If you don't trust them, don't name them, but you just, you, you have a smart person for them to do whatever's appropriate at the time, because my crystal ball only goes, you know, I, I can only do like three to four months, you know, 10 years from now, I don't know what it's gonna look like. And so the more, it's kind of counterintuitive, but the more specific provisions you have in, it tends to make it worse, not better. And it's hard to convince people of that fact. Let's That's talk about this, that happens all the time. Somebody's got, um, is widowed and they have three kids and one of them's a little problematic, doesn't really have a job, maybe drinks a little bit. And so they say, oh, we're just gonna give his share to his sister because she'll take care of him. Disaster, huh guys, talk about that. 
Well, if the sister's <laughs> married and she has a will, when the sister dies, the husband gets it rather than the child. So you have unintended heirs with that type of planning yeah. and it's not the way we like to plan. If you want to provide for someone and put restrictions on it, then state it specifically and put it in a spendthrift trust and you make sure it goes the way you want, but not inadvertently to an unintended heir. Here's yeah. another really big deal that we've all seen. Somebody might be on SSI or Medicaid and you may not know it. Obviously when someone's been disabled their whole life, that's true. But if someone's on government aid and they receive an inheritance, not only can it ruin their aid and disqualify them until they spend it down, but also the government that paid for them can take it back. And that's very dangerous, especially people do it all the time in IRAs because IRAs, you just name the beneficiary. You can't move an IRA and that's a really dangerous thing to do. So people on who are on any kind of aid, you have to be very careful. You guys want to tell a story on that? Yeah, I mean, I will tell you, most of my trusts have springing Medicaid trusts or springing special needs trusts built in them. So just in case you need it, it's there because if it becomes a first party trust, then there's payback to Medicaid when a beneficiary dies. So I believe in putting springing special needs trusts in. It's like when you go out of town and you pack a jacket, but you don't know if you need the jacket or not, but it's there. It's the same with springing special needs provisions. And I think it's important to have those in there. Otherwise, if you just get it, like Shannon mentioned on an IRA and you go in and try to do a Miller or D4A trust in guardianship court, when they die, that beneficiary dies, Medicaid gets paid back. And if you do it ahead of time and make sure there's planning built into the trust before you pass away, then they don't have the payback provision in it. So guys, let's talk about my favorite topic, pets. <laughs> <laughs> People have pets and they're part of your family. And you need, to, you need to say in your will of trust or someone who's gonna take care of the pets because maybe people will want the pets, maybe they won't. Maybe you should leave some money to take care of the pets. Nevada has a statute that says you can leave money in trust for a pet, but it has to be relative to the pet's needs and age. So if you have a 29-year-old horse like I do, you wouldn't leave a million dollars to take care of it. You would say, oh, it needs hay and horseshoes and shots every year. That might cost five grand. It might live five more years. So anyways, people should be very specific about who wants to take care of their pets and maybe leave a little money for them. Don't you guys think? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, no, I think it's very common. I think, you know, be creative when you draft out there or see your lawyer because you can sometimes try to draft around statutes a little bit too. But I think having that in there with the pet trust, I mean, we do those and Shannon, I know, has more experience than we do than I do. And uh, but we've done them and I do them pretty regularly. You're right. Rob has chickens. Yeah, okay. most. Of, well, yeah, most of I, I do human pets, you know, the kids. <laughs> the, <laughs> like refer to the adults, the adults in training, you know, that they're, you know, like my youngest daughter, as I was telling before, you know, we went uh, down to the beach and didn't put on sunblock. And it's like, really, you know, we, we trained you better than this. So they, even though they're legally of age, their their brains aren't ripe yet, you know. So I like to see the, the trust go continue for the kids until they're grown up, which is you pick an age 25, 30, 60, whatever it is, you know, for your particular kids and, you know, let them have, let them have some control, but after they're, you know, matured a little bit. And Rob, we mentioned this in the January seminar and um, I mentioned my friend who, uh, uh, she lives in Kentucky and she got as specific with her grandkids of, you'll get this, but you have to attend a University of Kentucky and you have to do this and this. You can get as specific as you want for somebody. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, and, and frankly, I, I've only had one client do the disinheritance that if that if his daughter didn't graduate from college <clears throat> by the time she was 30, she was out. OK, I prefer to have things of incentives in there. Of Right. If you graduate from college, you get this much you know first of all we're going to pay for education so forth and so on within the trust um so all of the all of the costs of education are covered but then instead of waiting till you're 30 you can get it at 25 or whatever it is we also build in things there what about if the child is unable to go do you have the language built in there that you're not going to penalize them if they're if for whatever reason or if they don't want to go to college you want to go to trade school or whatever you can you can be very specific right. Um, 
yeah, and and they, but again, I prefer the incentive rather than the penalty. Shannon, let's talk a little bit about IRAs because you mentioned them and how you can. Uh, uh, I know this is going to be another topic that we'll talk about in September on the charity planning side, but charitable planning, but how you can uh, use your IRA to support your favorite nonprofit, such as your local public television station. And the rules just changed in January. So right now, if you're 72 or up, you, you, except for Ross, you have to take out distributions, mandatory distributions every year from your retirement plan or IRA because the IRS doesn't want you to accumulate that money forever and never pay tax. So that's just the rules. They're called Required Minimum Distributions, RMDs. So the IRS has a setup called Qualified Charitable Distributions where you can have your annual distributions go straight to a charity and not incur any income tax on the distribution at all, where normally it would be ordinary income. So that's a great way to, if you don't need the income, to to qualify it for a charity. That's a fantastic way. The other way is to make a charity as a beneficiary and then they would get it when you pass or part of it. You don't have to do all or nothing. It could be part to your kids, part to charities. It's, it can be a lot of choices. So those are really great options and very flexible. One thing I think I should add that's really exciting and then we'll, um, when, it, when a person inherits an IRA as opposed to a spouse, generally it's up to each state whether there's any asset protection for that at all. And most states say no. In Nevada, we just changed our statute a few years ago that it's protected up to a million dollars each for the owner and a million dollars for the beneficiary. And that's very special. Our state's really good that way. And one thing uh, just to take care, to, to mention about charity and estate plans and IRAs, if you are going to name your trust as a beneficiary of a pension plan or any kind of annuity or anything, and uh, you, you want that to go to the charity because it's not a good asset to give to your non-charitable beneficiaries like cash and brokerage accounts and stuff, you want to have a clause in your trust that says you shall use IRD, income in respect of decedent assets, to fund charitable bequests. And if you have that language in there, you can have your trust as the Benny of your IRA, and then when your trustee does the administration, do a trustee to trustee distribution for the charity, and then you avoid that IRD issue. And uh, you want to have that language in your trust. So if you do have charitable beneficiaries named in your trust, uh, you definitely want to make sure you have that special language in there for sure. Rob, you're nodding your head. Anything you want to add? Oh, just that uh, the, the obvious thing of it's deductible. So yeah, so you you can. Whatever bequest during life, those are those are even better because you can see the benefit of what you have done. Um, those are nice. That's deductible. And then also anything at death, of course. And and you'd want those to be your whatever you're giving things to be your low basis assets, the ones that have the most appreciation because you can avoid all the capital gain on that. So you can give if you have stocks or anything like that, you can give it to your favorite charity, again, one that might rhyme with PBS or something. Um, and, and and you don't have to you don't have to recognize that built-in gain. So you bought it here, it's now worth here. If you sold it, you'd have to have the capital gain, you'd pay that income tax, you give it away, you get the deduction based on the fair market value. So you get the biggest bang for your buck in giving appreciated assets to charity. Of course, that's actually know, how we received our our largest single annual gift this year. We had an individual at the end of the year who purchased a stock at nine dollars and he sold it at ninety nine dollars, and he would rather us have it than the government. And uh, we were very very grateful for that individual for doing it, and we encourage others to consider uh, that process as well. Or Jim, going back to your first question about what was your original car, if you have that, it's probably time to donate it. <laughs> just a thought okay actually kind of going back to that rob what was your first car oh it was a toyota corolla okay it was, shannon it was white it was painted with refrigerator paint <laughs> shannon what was yours my parents gave me his 68 firebird and it was a hot rod nice david your first car mine was a nova concourse <laughs> Okay, hey, Nova, yeah, that's really, that's almost as good as a Corolla. I would have won the race. If we drag raced, I would have won. I would have won. <laughs> okay, so Jim, so I, I was going to school in Utah at that point. The back, tie, the, the back rear wheel would freeze and would have to, in the morning, I'd have to get hot water 
to take it out, splash it on the tire to be able to go. And I couldn't wait till after dark when it froze again for me to leave. I did that once. We went to a movie and came back and and we had three tires that went. It's just the one that was the little that was the difficulty. So tragic. Yeah, first, first cars. That's that's boy. Those are the days. <laughs> first cars tells a lot about an individual because it's usually your. Uh, there's challenges associated with it and it really helps you grow as an individual for what's needed it's it it's care. a question i like to ask I too fast it's it's yes. quite a while. yeah all right we're coming close to an end um but right now uh, there's a lot of topics that we have uh again if you have any questions please send them to me right now through the chat box oh i do well, have some about, let's talk real fast dana brought up the the change to the homestead exemption that's a big thing and it's good Oh, yes, yes. Yes. Okay. I think our home, yeah, it was changed in uh, 2019. It's now 605,000 of equity in your home free of creditors. It was 550. And in addition, Nevada allows you to homestead your home in the name of your trust. Some states like Florida, you lose your homestead, but in Nevada, we allow it. So always uh, have the trustees do it on behalf of the, uh, you know, them usually as their own beneficiaries of it. But we are we have specifically in our statute provide for that. So just FYI. also, if you sell your house and it's your primary residence homestead and five or six hundred five thousand is protected from creditors, even the sale yeah. proceeds. So that's yeah. that's. That was what was added in the statute. Interesting. My one of my the firms I work with and Shannon knows Mark Solomon's office. They had that tacking period put into the proceeds, and it's a pretty convoluted process, but it is in the statute. Shannon, good point. Versus, like in California, the homestead is worthless. It's an amount reasonably to keep you alive, not your standard of living, just to keep you alive, which in California is that's ridiculous. So it doesn't work the same in every state. And oh, if you refinance your house, a lot of times the homestead inadvertently comes off. So you have to check online to see if your homestead's still on there because sometimes people lose them and they don't know it. They don't send you a notice you got off. Yeah, speaking of refinances, the most common mistake there is that the lenders won't want to redo your loan in the trust name because they don't want to have to read the trust and make decisions. So they make it, you take it out of the trust, put the loan on, that that's that part works really well. The part everybody forgets about is putting it back in after they're done. I got about four questions here that just came in really oh. fast. So yeah. let's see what we got here. Um, what if you can't or don't want to leave possessions to anyone in your family? What is the best way to get rid of everything? Omit them and pick who you want to get it. Friends, charities, pick. Goodwill. Yeah, and a lot of people say leave $10 or $100. I say leave nothing, acknowledge their existence, and with intention, disinherit them. Leave them nothing if you're going to leave nothing. That's generally the case, and depending on the size. But. Good question. Okay. Can a will include reasons why bequeaths might be different for different recipients? Example, nieces and nephews, and is this an okay idea? You can, but it could say whatever you want. But I prefer not to say reasons why this one gets more than the other, because that could open the door to fighting. And even though most trusts are, especially trusts are not conducive to fighting, they could still have some clarifications and have to register it with court and determine what the trust, what the person meant. So I think don't get specific like that. It's no help. Yeah, because if you say because they did X, Y, Z, and all of a sudden it was a mistake that they didn't do X, Y, Z, and the trust maker was not aware of that, then as Shannon mentioned, you're just bringing up more confusion and problems. So. Yeah, more. Well, that's more of a PBS drama episode than a reality that we want to have going on, correct? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, less is more. I prefer not. I'm doing a trust now for a client that insists. He has two sons, the good one, the bad one. And so... On the bad one, he's limiting him, you know, good one this much, bad one this much, and he's making me put in, it's because he didn't trust dad. You know, it's like, really, how is that going to help anything? You know, that makes you feel better today, but that's going to open the door for problems in the future. Okay, here's a really interesting question, and I know none of you would ever uh, have this happen, uh, but it's interesting. My trusts were written years ago in, I'll just put another state. Um, I currently live in Nevada, retired. The attorney in that other state has since been incarcerated for illegal practices. 
would those trusts still be valid now? Yes, but dangerous. You should have someone look at it and make sure. They're still valid, but dangerous, probably. What do you think? Well, it's, it's, it's good to review them um, if you're a Nevada resident to update them, like David said. Like, you, you want to do this periodically anyway, particularly if you're a little suspect, but no. Bad attorney doesn't mean, or naughty attorney doesn't mean it's a bad trust. But be careful because maybe the attorney put his name in as a trust protector, or as a trustee, or mm -hmm. something like that. So, like Rob said, good to update and look at. Right. Yeah. So that's there's a difference between bad person and bad attorney, and that's bad attorney by yeah. making yourself in. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Uh, I think I've covered everybody here. Okay, I'll let that one go. Reason we already did that one. Nope, I think we're good. So let's do a final thought here. We'll go Shannon first, then David, then Rob. So something that you want to let the audience know that either we covered and you want to emphasize it or that we didn't cover that you want to get in. What happens all the time when something happens unexpectedly to someone, even if they had trust and wills, is things aren't titled correctly. So look at your investment statements, look at your bank statements, look at your deeds. Is the trust name on there? If it's an IRA, is there a beneficiary? Find that stuff. If there's life insurance, is there a beneficiary? And just have it organized so at least you know how things are titled right now. I, I would you know Shannon's is the most important lesson. Make sure everything is titled correctly. Make sure your documents are up to date and powers of attorney for health and property. And estate planning is an act of love. It's love for yourself, love for your loved ones and, and do the planning. And I think it's important to review and do. Mm -hmm. I can say ditto and ditto. Um, the, 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 the main thing is that there are a lot of neat things that you can do within your trust that you probably aren't even aware of. Okay, that that in the reviewing process, um, you, you want to be able to make sure that you've got all the cool bells and whistles. You've got the kids protected from themselves, from the rest of the world. You have the assets in, you know, just periodically, you know, like, you know, tune up, make sure it's all good. And uh, then you can rest well, sleep well at night. One last thing. We've all seen this a million times. You don't know if something's going to happen to you, and it does, and nobody knows the passwords to your safe. The, 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 no one knows the passwords to your computer, and you get all your bills online. you got to have something, an envelope, somebody you trust that knows your stuff, or no one can get in anything, and they can't find anything. Good point. Yes, good point. Well, at the beginning of our seminar, we asked four questions, and... The question, question number three was, do you know where your beneficiary form is and have you reviewed it recently? And we had, I think if I recall, we had about two thirds that knew where it was and one third that didn't. So hopefully after um, our discussion today, that will change to 99 know where it is and maybe one doesn't know um, there. And then also on the homestead exemption, we asked, and there was three answers. One was yes, the other was no, the other one was no, I don't know. So hopefully at least the 30% that had I don't know will now jump into that yes category, thanks to you, so that we can provide this valuable um, financial literacy to our viewers here. So again, I can't thank all of you enough. Um, Shannon, Rob, and David are available for private consultations. Um, you're going to receive a... Uh, uh, evaluation um, when this is over. Uh, please forgive my technical challenges um, on this. We're judging it on the content, not on the uh, production that we put together. Um, we can't wait again to get back in person. We hope this is very soon. Um, we are going to take the summer off. So even though Shannon, Rob, and David are uh, amazing volunteers on our plan giving council, we take the summer off. Our next seminar is going to be September 14th. It's gonna be on my favorite topic as a major guest officer, charitable planning. And I know this is a topic near and dear to David's heart and also Shannon um, on top of that. So they'll be back with us for this. Again, I can't thank you all enough for uh, being here today with us. Can't wait to see everybody again in person. 
Everybody have a great summer and thank you all for all that you're doing for us. And I just want to thank our sponsor, Silver State Schools Credit Union, one last time for allowing us to bring you uh, these seminars. And thank you again. Take care.